Welcome, Chris and Landman, to Game On Magazine. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Kristen, let's just give our readers a little bit of background information. Tell us about your earliest memory of first climbing on a bike. So, um, I grew up as a tomboy. Um, I think most girls that do the sport are tomboys and they come from a tomboy background. And my cousin had a motorbike and my father made a bet with me because I was um, a provincial swimmer when I was young. And he said to me, if you make the karting team, um, I'll buy you a motorbike. And I made the team and he bought me a little Pee Wee 80, I don't remember this pink and white. And ever since then, as everyone says, the bug bit, and I was addicted. And then I went from a little Pee Wee 80 onto uh, RM85 when I got to Big Fruit. And then my parents realized that motorbiking was quite dangerous, mm -hmm. and they tried to steer me in the direction of quads. <laughs> that didn't last long, that lasted mm -hmm. a few months. And then they tried go karts, and that also didn't last long. And then I was back onto motorbikes, and here I am. What's like, um, how many years? 16 years later. And when you did get these bikes, did your dad used to ride with you or was there a particular person that inspired your interest in enduro riding? Um, my uncle, I'd have to say my uncle, um, he started off with me, he was really good, my uncle Ingo, because my cousin Stefan rode, so um, he always took us riding, yet Stefan and I were pretty closely aged, and so we spent a lot of time together and obviously he took us riding because he could ride. My dad did try ride with us, but it didn't last long. Okay. Yeah. And was there particular moments or race during this time or an obstacle that you overcame when you realized or identified that you had a talent in riding? Um, it would have probably had to happen to have been when I, I just started to do well, you know. I didn't, I didn't think of taking it seriously, I just started to have fun on the motorbike and then I started to keep up with the guys and then my father said, you know what, I'm willing to put the time and effort into you and um, I loved it. For me it wasn't um, a matter of, oh, I've got to compete now, it was just fun, fun, fun. I mean, I all I wanted to do was ride and it turned into something that has now turned into a profession. And the roof of Africa, this was obviously a breaking point of your career. What was your mindset approaching the roof? Had you, you know, won a couple of races that you had the confidence to think you could overcome something like that? Or was it just a dream and you wanted to test yourself? You know, my, when I was young, my father always said to me, you know, one day you're going to do a roof of Africa. And I said, oh, please, Dad, that'll never happen. A woman doing the roof of Africa, it's impossible. And um, 2012 came and I entered the roof and that was my first attempt at the roof. And I didn't get very far. I had bike problems and it was just, you know, just a learning curve. And then 2013 I couldn't ride as I was injured and then 2014 came and I put the prep, put the time in, raced the National Enduros locally mm -hmm. and um, someone said to me if you can finish the National Enduros on time then you should be able to try and attempt uh, the Roof of Africa and in 2014 I went for the, uh, um, I mean I attempted it for the first time properly and um, geez, my father used to say to me you're going to finish the Roof of Africa and then when I did finish the Roof of Africa I, I didn't believe it was possible and I, I did it, I mean it was, yeah. it was great. It's uh, an achievement that anyone who finishes the race, route, whether it's bronze, silver, gold, should mm -hmm. be proud of. And that feeling, you said that it was something you prepared for, it was a confidence booster, it's something you thought you couldn't even do, possibly. So what was that feeling of crossing the finish line? Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. I can't describe it to you. I would, I would say put on a helmet and go try it yourself. Yeah. It's, um, you feel like you're on top of the world and, and to know that you, you've done it for the first time and also to do it alone, know that you navigated, you got through the sections, mm. um, mountain passes and to know what you've been through when your body's so tired and there were so many times when I wanted to give up. To finish, um, that's great and especially when you've got so many people backing you mm. and you make them proud. Mm. It's, you've got your family, your sponsors and your friends and I had that, I had great support and I promise you now like it's an individual sport but it's behind the scenes it's a team sport. A team sport. Yeah. One of the videos, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos about you prepping for the interview and I've seen you finishing the roof and you know training for different events but one of the, the videos that stood out the most to me was when you pulled up in the pits and you had this whole crowd behind you that held each other and you know they were cheering and, and looking you know after you in such pride so how important is it to have a support structure in this kind of sp um, sports oh it's so important like I said um, I race on the bike by myself but um, when I go home or when I come into the pits I've got a team and then mm. my, so I've got a team looking after my bike I've got a team looking after me um, we just got to go out there and we've got to get from point A to point B and then they're waiting there for us and to know it's a big thing knowing that I've got to finish a race and if I don't finish I'm going to disappoint a lot of people mm. so for me that's a lot of inspiration I finished the races knowing that I don't want to let anyone down, personally myself, but most mm -hmm. importantly my family because along the way a lot of sacrifice has gone into it from my mom, my dad, mm -hmm. my brother, my sister, I mean my friends, um, it's, it's a team sport and like I say it wouldn't have been possible and mm -hmm. all the stuff that I do every day isn't possible without the, the sport structure that I have. Yes. 
And you said there's been a lot of sacrifice from your family. You said earlier that your mom and dad thought it was a bit of a dangerous sport in the beginning. So what kind of mental barriers and physical barriers did you have to overcome, you know, with the relationship and the dynamics within your family to, you know, to convince them that this isn't so dangerous and it's something you'd like to do? Um, when it comes to my dad, he's really supportive. He believes just get up and carry on. He's, he's strong like that. But my mom has been the hardest, been the hardest part. You know, she's um, at the end of the day, I'm her little baby girl. Yes. So um, for me to get on the bike and from the accidents that I have had, um, every time I get on the bike, it's, she's terrified. And the moment I get off the motorbike, I've got to pick up my phone and phone, phone my mom and say, Mom, I'm safe. Or unless someone else has done it for me, because it's a, it's a permanent worry and it is a, it is a dangerous sport. Mm -hmm. And as you do know, we have lost a few lives in the sport over the years. And um, you know what, um, I guess she doesn't want anything to happen to me and it's safety at the end of the day and just finishing is important to her. But then again, this is the love of my life. Um, this is what makes me happy. So I will continue to do it. At a point, sometimes I do think it is selfish because when I'm injured, my mom's got to look after me or she's got to pay for the doctor's bills or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but she supports me and she knows how much I love it and she knows how much it means to me. So um, I, just, I guess I've just got to thank her because I wouldn't be doing this sport if it wasn't for my mom yeah, and my dad. Exactly. Tell us a little bit about your accidents in 2013. I mean, you had just seen breakthrough in your career. You had attempts at the roof. You were, you know, really getting serious about Endure and then you have this accident. Um, so yeah, so 2013 was a complete life-changing experience for me. Um, I look back on it now and I, I don't regret it for a second. Um, at the time, it was hard. I mean, I had a, a high-speed crash in Botswana at a, what they used, what a different form of riding, what we call off-road, so it's more fast. Um, mm -hmm fast high speeds, um, in between trees, um, long down, long fast straights, and I had a bit of a, a hassle and I pushed the front brakes to avoid something and I hit a tree stump and it went into my tummy and because of that I suffered internal injuries, I burst my small intestine and um, severed my pancreas off my small intestine and because I was in Botswana, um, there wasn't the greatest health care. Um, I went to one of the private hospitals there and they didn't pick up anything with me. So I only was flown home, flew, flown home the next day, um, which landed up to be 38 hours later, which I was seen to. And um, having all of that rubbish in my stomach, all my organs went septic. And it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was hard for my parents because, and for me, because I just, I mean, I just got there. I didn't know what was wrong with me. No one had told me what was wrong with me. I went into the operating on the operating table and then woke up two weeks later. So. Um, I had sustained, um, as I said, everything went septic. I was on life support for 11 days. Um, I, you know, just the infection rate, it was up, down the whole time, up, down the whole time. But my parents didn't know whether I would survive, but um, but I pulled through. Um, like I say, it was, it was a tough road. It was long, it was hard, but more so for my family and friends, not for me, because I don't remember much of it, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, they had to deal with it. Um, and then people ask me, you get on a motorbike and you carry on riding. I think the reason why I pulled through is because I was, I, I couldn't wait to get back on my motorbike. I mean, first thing I woke up when I, well, first thing I said when I woke up, I said, is my bike okay? So, oh, no <laughs> of course my bike's okay, but it's what got me through and it's what inspired me. And it's, and from that, why I say I don't regret it for a second is because it was a, a turning point in my life, which I made me realize um, a lot of things. Um, it taught me a life lesson to appreciate the, the people around you, which I do way more now. I mean, I spend a lot more time with my family and my friends, and I appreciate them. And it also taught me balance, to find balance between family, friends, fun, and my sports. Yes. And ever since then, my bra riding has taken off. It's yes. like a 360 degree turn in my riding, my performance, mm -hmm. and in life. I mean, um, before there, I was was living my life, but like now, I can, I can honestly say I'm living my life, and I am who I am. and. Uh, like I said, it's just been, it's been a great experience. Yes. Were there any mental barriers that you ever had to overcome when you got back on the bike for the first time? Oh yeah, I still got them. I don't go over fourth gear. So, oh really? <laughs> so first, second, third and fourth and that's as far as it goes. So I won't, you won't catch me riding fast. That's why I prefer okay. the extreme Enduros because yes. I mean, they're really slow. Mm. Um, but the moment it gets to a high speed race or we have to go fast, I completely back off and I don't think I'll ever be able to go fast again. And, it, and, and in some races, it does set me back quite a bit, mm -hmm. but I'd rather be safe and rather finish a race than, and then never mm -hmm. have to go through that again. Does that help your mom too, knowing that you're not pursuing like high-speed races more? Yeah, yeah completely. Um, yeah. You know, she's, she's happy with the, the extreme endurance and, you know, a touch wood. 
I haven't really had any serious injuries since then. Yes. Um, and also, I, I ride smart now. You know, mm -hmm. you know, people, um, youngsters, youngsters especially, they like to ride fast because everyone says they haven't had their first crash. And I hope their first crash isn't as bad as mine. But you only learn once you experience it. And yes. I learned the hard way. But thank God, I'm still here today. But um, it's part of the sport, like I said. And um, yeah, my parents are happy that I do extreme injuries. Mm -hmm. they're, they're slower. They're safer. And um, and, I'm, and I, put my, I must say, I'm, I'm succeeding pretty well in it. Yes. And when you made your comeback here, you didn't, you know, ease into Enduro again. You took on Romaniacs. <laughs> why, why did you go for such an extreme race first? And um, how come you didn't take a year to sort of ease into it? You know what? I, I was just so excited to get back onto the bike. I never, and Romaniacs was never ever on the cards for mm -hmm. me. I never even thought about it. And then... Um, Francisco from KTM and then my sponsors, Leader Tread, they approached me and said, you know what, come try an extreme endurer and my whole team was going and they said, just give it a bash, see what happens and, you know, if you finish, you finish, if you don't, you don't, you know, it's a learning experience and I had never raced overseas before yes. and um, I got given the opportunity and I, an opportunity I couldn't turn down, so I took it with open arms and it just so happened that um, I finished and it's the first, first time for me um, finishing, that was my first ever extreme drill that I actually finished yes. and to do it in Romania, in Europe, uh, it was one of the highlights of my career. That kind of technical riding is also rated as one of the hardest rides in the world. How would you compare that, you know, to give a South African rider a bit of perspective to something like the Roof of Africa? You know what? Um, you get such different extreme enduros. Romaniacs, in comparison, I'm going to compare it to the Roof of Africa. Romaniacs is six, six days of riding. Um, we, we complete about 200 to 160 kilometers a day. Whereas the Roof of Africa is only three days of riding and you do a lot less distance between, let's say, 100 and 120 kilometers a day. Mm. But at the end of Roof, I am, my body, my hands, is, it's 10 times worse than it was at Romaniacs. Romaniacs has got a lot, um, it's more, it's hard, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's, you need more of a technique to ride Romaniacs than you do for Roof. As South Africans are good at riding rocks, mm. and then for us to go over to Romania, they've got mountains that are never ending. Yes. They've got the steepest downhills that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I wouldn't even walk down there, now I've got to go down with a motorbike. And whereas the Roof, it's, it's completely two different places. South Africans are good at riding rocks, and that's why we can ride it, but it's so rough, it's so hard on your hands. I mean, if you ride, that long distance in Romania, you just climb up a mountain and then you've got smooth riding on top until you go down again. Whereas Roof of Africa, you'll, it'll be rough from start to end, where you're whether you're riding on gravel roads, up a mountain, down a mountain. It's just yes. it's so much harder on your body, whereas Romania exists. Yes. I'd compare it to Natal riding. Romania is like riding in Natal. Okay. If you have had the opportunity to ride in Natal. Yes. How do you mentally prepare for not knowing the kind of terrain you will face? I mean, you know, you could, if you're in South Africa and you know you're going to go and ride Romaniacs with steep downhills and that kind of riding, do you travel around South Africa to find different terrains or do you just make the most of what you have in your area? Um, yeah, we do. So I've got a, a good group of riding friends. I, I ride with my teammate Dwayne Clenance and then my very good friend Warren Barwell. We spend a lot of time traveling. So what we do is we'll, we'll go find similar terrain in South Africa. So whether it be in Lesotho or we go like before Romaniacs now, we spend a lot of time training in Natal, South Coast and then Hilton because they've got hills, forests and we try and mimic to the best um, of what is, is coming up in our race. Okay. So like with Lesotho, we're lucky we can go to Lesotho and train. Yes. But like Romaniacs, we'll have to make the best with what we have in the top. Okay. And as a woman, you're out there alone, it's you and your bike, and you see this massive steep downhill. What is it that you tell yourself to overcome that physical barrier that's telling you not to try this or not to go down? I, I try not to overthink it. Okay. <laughs> the, more, the more I think about it, um, then I, like, I freak myself out, mm -hmm. and then I actually end up hesitating. And you know how the saying goes, hesitation is devastation. Yes. So I rather just sometimes these obstacles I ride, closing my eyes and hope <laughs> I make it. Um, but you know, as you, the more you ride, the more you learn technique and you learn how to ride that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like I say, I try to practice as much as what I would think would be in the race. So I will ride down terrifying, terrifying downhills. So when it comes to to it in the race. I've written down similar stuff, so I know how to do it. Yes. Okay, well, that's very interesting. And, um, let's see here. So, there was a race that you did called the Red Bull Brave Man in 2015, and the whole catchphrase is, are you brave enough? 
What is it about you as a select group of women in the country who's willing to try something like this? What is it about you that sets you apart that you can say, yes, you are brave enough to take on such a race? Uh, you know what, um, within the sport, a lot of guys, especially with the women in the sport, they're very um, enthusiastic about having a woman come and race their race. So with that race, the organizers contacted me and said, come and do the race. Um, mm. I was very lucky to have all my expenses paid for. And um, you know what, an another opportunity to ride my motorbike in a different country, get to meet new people, mm. I couldn't turn it down. So. I had no idea what we're going into okay. and um, I just I winged it and I landed up finishing which was great and I did pretty well and uh, I got to meet new people, make new contacts. It's just um, another great opportunity and another mm. box I can tick off another extreme enduro I did. Yes. Is that advice that you would give to younger enduro riders that you know might be a little bit afraid of trying new things? Is it better to go into a race with no expectations? You know what, like I, I learned the hard way. I mean, I went into races and I had, I thought I was prepared for them and I wasn't. I mean, I remember my first ever national enduro, it took me eight hours to finish one lap, mm. eight hours. And so I've had my hard times and I've had um, where I've battled. And I know a lot, a lot of women, there are so many women out there that, are ride, that ride, but they are so intimidated to ride because yes. they're scared of racing. Whether you go there and you, it takes you eight hours to finish that one lap, you're going to leave there exhausted and you're going to want to throw your motorbike and get away. But mm -hmm. the next day you're going to think, okay, I actually learned so much. And all those experiences that I've had, that I haven't finished races, that I've spent eight hours out there, that I mean, I've had to push my bike across the finish line, they're all um, experiences. And it's all something that's made me a better rider. It either makes you or breaks you. So whether you use it as a positive mm -hmm. or a negative, it's up to you. But I mean, I think go out there, you try the races, spent eight to ten hours out there doing mm -hmm. one lap pushing your bike crying I mean I cried mm -hmm. in races I get so <laughs> frustrated but at the end of the day it's just learning and it's just experience yes what do you tell yourself in those moments when you're crying and you just want to throw your bike down and you know you wonder if this is for you how is it that you you push through to the end you just got to carry on no one else is going to come and ride your bike to the finish yes. line you you're out there by yourself and you know that you've got to get through it um, that's what I just want. When I'm in that situation, all I want to do is get to the finish line. Mm -hmm. So that's like sitting there and crying and kicking your motorbike and complaining is not going to do anything. You've got to get on the bike and carry on. Was there any particular race that you had a moment like that that stands out to you? Um, let me think about it. Um, last year, Romaniacs attempting silver for the first time. Okay. Um, it was hard. I mean, I thought I was prepared. That was one of those races where I thought I was prepared. Um, mm -hmm. And I had no idea what was to come which I thought I did. Um, I thought I was fit enough. I thought my bike skills were good enough and I got a, a rude awakening. I, mm. I got a complete riding lesson. Um, day one was the one of the hardest days I've ever done. I managed to finish, but thereafter it was just so hard, so tiring. They got, I got to a section and I just, I couldn't ride it. I tried everything. I must've sat there for about an hour and a half and I got nowhere. And um, I wanted to give up, but I couldn't. I mean, I can't go back. I don't know what's behind me. And I have to keep going forward because that's the way the route went. And I just had to push through. Um, it was hard. And it, I mean, after that, I felt like quitting riding because I wasn't, I said, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. This isn't for me. But um, it's motivated me now. It's made me a better rider. And um, I'm going back this year to try it again. Okay. You would think I'm mad, but it's it's what what it's what inspires me. Yes, and what are you hoping to achieve this year for Maniacs? Finish silver. Finish silver. You know, I don't I don't believe a woman's ever finished silver. Uh, not from my history and from my knowledge. Um, I know there is going to be another lady racing silver with me this year. Sandra Gomez. She's um, she's one of the best in the world. So. Um, both of us will probably go head on head and, and, and race race against yes. each other and see who's the first one at the finish line. Does that competition scare you at all or does it push you forward? I mean, to just finish a kind of a race like that is, is enough on an, yes. enough of a challenge on its own. But to know that, you know, if you take the wrong line or you make the wrong decision, that your competitor will pass you, must put immense pressure on you. For me, I've been racing against guys in the extreme enduros. So, but the moment there is another lady in the mix, of course it's competition yes. and I'm a competitive person. That's why I race. So yes, I do want to be the first one across the finish line, but then at the same time, I'm so happy that someone else is doing the sport with me and I'm mm -hmm. not the only girl out there and there's someone else who's brave enough and got the skill to do it, yeah. which is really cool. So whether or not she finishes before me, I'll be happy for her and if I finish for her, I'll be over the moon. I mean, I mean, um, 
it's competition and um, to be the first one to finish is obviously my goal mm. but even if I just cross the finish line after yes. knowing how hard it is and how, how much I've completed I'll be really happy mm. with that. The terrain obviously isn't going to change from last year but how will your mindset have hopefully have changed to to finish silver this year? Um, I think I've got a lot of a, uh, my mind's a bit stronger you know whereas as back then um, I've also matured a lot as a rider um, my riding experience has grown so um, I won't give up so easily um, just from my experiences last year I'm gonna make sure that this year I don't make those same mistakes like yeah. this year I'll go in fitter I mean I've got a trials bike now so I'm practicing my trial skill on stuff that I did battle with so hopefully this year I won't and then also I've just got back from Romaniacs now well not Romania I was in Romaniacs I was in Romania riding King of the Hill okay. and just to go and ride that and be in Romania and ride similar terrain and know that I did well it well it is already um, it's a confidence booster yes one of the standout um, moments of your 2015 year was finishing Skeet Sea to Sky. So just to give our viewers a little bit of background, you were the only woman in the world to have ever finished gold for Sea to Sky. There's one particular, you know, kind of part of the, the race that stands out to me. It's Mount Olympus. So tell me a little bit about your mindset in my, in, when you're climbing Mount Olympus. There isn't room for error or choosing the wrong line or, you know, feeling sorry for yourself. So tell me a little bit about, you know, that moment of climbing this mountain. Uh, you know what, um, we always, when they give us out the routes and they tell us how many kilometers we have and how many checkpoints we have, you watch the clock and you think, okay, you've reached that point now, when is the finish line going to come? And then when we started to climb Mount Olympus and I had already done like six hours, 20 minutes, and I knew cutoff was at seven hours and I didn't know how much further was ahead because by that time we had passed the kilometers and I was like, oh, you never know how much further is left. I was ex absolutely shattered. I was tired. Um, and I knew that I had to keep pushing because, I mean, I was 40 minutes away from being cut off. And um, I didn't know how much further was ahead. And then we uh, came across some hikers, which was so cool. And I said to him, listen, I'm tired. How much further is the finish? They're like you're literally 10 minutes mm -hmm. away. And that feeling just gave me so much energy and um, I must have gone up gone up there it was quite quite a little far section up to the top and there was a little step at the top but the moment you see people and, and a crowd it's like your second wind and it's it's exciting to know that you reached reached the finish line and then again you've got all this energy and you're pumped and you just can't wait to get to the finish line so getting to the top um, I only realized how high we were when we got into the gondola I never knew how high it was I knew it was a few thousand meters up yeah over 2,000 I think yeah um, but the only time I realized how, how high we were was when we were going down the gondola back down to the ground. And I really like actually realized we actually just climbed all the way up there, which was a pretty cool feeling. No ways. Yeah. Some people might never even hike up there in their lives. So how would you describe the view and the feeling of making it up there on your bike? Oh, that was the best feeling in the world. I had tears in my eyes and then my, my, my best friend, Dan, was waiting there with the South African flag. It, it, mm. it was like the dream come true. I never, I never thought it was possible. Um, I went into that race thinking, okay, cool, I'm going to make go for silver, you know, just get as far as I can. I think silver sil silver was my goal. I had my heart set on, on, on silver. And when I got to the silver finish, the cutoff, they're like, you've got more than enough time. Keep pushing, keep pushing. And I thought, geez, okay, maybe gold is actually, is, it's, it's achievable. And I think um, no one thought I would get to gold. Mm -hmm. And um, just getting up there and, and the organizer of the race, Martin, came up to me and he's like, you, you just made history. You finished the first ever, you have been the first woman to finish an extreme zero. Uh, my heart sunk, you know, it took a long time for it to set in, I don't think it has set in, <laughs> no. um, but it's, it's cool, you know, it's, yes. it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a great feeling and I just want to go do more of it, mm -hmm. I want to finish more races, I mean, I want to be the first woman to ever finish gold at the Roof of Africa, you know, it's just made me more hungry. Okay, and when you get up to the top, you're in a familiar place, you know, it's unfamiliar terrain, mm -hmm. What is the, the comfort of seeing the South African flag when you get up to the top of that mountain? Uh, it's just, um, you know, because then you, I know that I'm going to be making so many people at home proud. Yes. Um, my mom, my dad, my friends, my family, and all the support I have. I've got such a great following. And to hold the flag on top of that mountain, and then you've got the Red Bull arch behind you. Oh. Um, I, yeah, I'm smiling now. Yes. It's, it's, it's a memory I, I want to relive every day. Yes. Um. You know, there's many sports that connect an athlete to nature. There's trail running, there's surfing. Enduro is also one of those sports. How does the influence of the things you get to see and experience, you know, influence your your, your mindset while you're riding? Oh, I think um, us enduro riders, we are so lucky. We get to see um, 
be able to ride in places and see views that not many people will ever see. You get to see in pictures, but to be able to live it and ride in the places that we see and see the views that we see and uh, it's unbelievable. That's my favorite thing about riding. And often when we're racing, we actually don't get time to stop and take a look around us and see what see what there is. But every time I ride, I do try to take it all in because it's, it's beautiful. I mean, the stuff I've seen and the places we've ridden and it's, I can't even describe to you how beautiful it is. It's, 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 it's one of the bonuses of the sport, being able to take a motorbike into places that people won't even be able to walk. Yes. How else do you pursue this feeling of adventure and being close to nature in your life? Is there other sports that you like? or? Um, I love the ocean. So okay. um, I've always been, uh, I'd love to have lived by, by the sea. Um, so I, I do tend to surf a lot when I go down to, to the coast. So if I, if I ever go to riding by the coast, I've had my surfboard with me. And then Joburg, I ride my mountain bike. You know, okay. if I'm not on my motorbike, I'll be on my mountain bike. Okay. I enjoy mountain biking. Mm. It's uh, sport specific training, other than it's like the same thing as a motorbike, just no engine. Mm. Um, and I enjoy that. And I like going, I love taking my dogs to the park. I've, I've got three dogs that are like my children and okay. my best friends. So I love going to spend a day at the dam with them and just chilling out in nature. Yeah. I'm an outside person, you don't catch me indoors. I don't watch too much TV. If it is, okay. it's only got to do with motorbikes. <laughs> so I love being out outdoors, swimming, playing with my dogs, riding my motorbike, my mountain bike, mm -hmm. and surfing. How would you encourage other women in this country to pursue the same adventure that you pursue, not just with extreme things, but in the simple things like walking your dogs? Um, you know what it is, uh, just enjoy the small things. Yeah. You know, we spend most of our lives staring at our cell phones or worrying about buying this or buying that when actually you can just step outside and enjoy what's natural and what's what's God's what God has gifted us with. And that's what I, I, love. I love it. It's how I've been brought up. Um, my parents always encouraging me to go outdoors and enjoy 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 the simple things in life. Yes. If we look at more the technical side of riding, how do you find a bike that suits you? You're currently on the free rider. What is it about this bike that, that you know appeals to you and, and is comfortable? So when um, Francisca first told me about the free ride, um, I mean I looked at, looked at the bike on the internet and I read up about it and it's what it is, it's a cross between a trials bike and a motorbike. Um, it's a lot lighter, um, it's a very, what I would call a user friendly motorbike, it's lower to the ground and um, it's got its pros and cons, but for me, it's it's the best best bike, especially for a female. Um, it's light. It's very easy to ride, and in extreme enduros, it's got what you would call torque. And so the bike doesn't stall easily. Um, it tracks up anything, and like I said, I can put both my feet on the ground all the time. Therefore, therefore minimizing my mistakes. I make very few mistakes on the bike. Um, yeah. What did you ask me again? Oh, yeah, like how would you find the bike that suits you most? Okay, yeah. So no, those so, kind of things. So, um, for, the, for the extreme enduros, the free rides, the free rides probably the best bike. Best bike. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm most comfortable on. And as well, um, confidence is a big thing with extreme yes. riding because you have to hit something with confidence or go down a hill with confidence. And on that bike, I feel most confident. Okay. So that's why I ride. And a lot of people say to me, why don't you ride the 200 or ride a bigger bike or a faster bike? Mm. I, I don't feel comfortable on the other bikes, you know, I feel comfortable on my free ride and um, I know that I can, if there's a, a, a daunting mountain ahead or a step up, I'll hit it on my free ride, whereas on my 200 I would hesitate. Yes. So that's why I ride the bike and that's why for a girl I would recommend free ride. If you're interested in riding enduro, extreme enduros, I wouldn't recommend anything else. Yes. And if you, you said earlier that these events you take on is two to three days, or a maniacs is like six or seven days. for that impressive riding we can just see what how much you enjoyed and how much of a lifestyle this is to you and one final question if you could do anything else besides riding is there any other interests or maybe possibly a later career that you'd want to pursue so currently while um, I'm riding and then on my spare time I am doing my PPL which is my private pilot's license 
Um, I'm halfway through that, and then after that, I'd obviously like to go do my commercial license, and then hopefully become pilot one day. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you very much, Kurtzman, for joining us at Game On Magazine, and we wish you all the best for the rest of the year. Thank you very much.